century and a half have passed since the mountain men came to seek their fortunes in the land that was to become Utah. They were fur trappers, frontiersmen, soldiers of fortune who traveled alone with no home but the packs on their backs. Their names were Broken Hand Fitzpatrick, William Sublette, Jedediah Smith, Jim Bridger. In the springtime of 1825, they came down from the mountains to rendezvous in the high valleys of the Wasatch. It was the social event of the season, a time for the renewing of old bonds and the making of new ones. It was a time for trading and the telling of tall tales, for shooting matches and contests of skill. Above all, it was a time for celebration. In a few short years, the men of the Rocky Mountain Fur Company would come to know the high country as few have known it since. Still, much of the territory remained to be discovered, and two generations would pass before a government surveyor named John Wesley Powell would set out to explore the canyons of the Green and Colorado Rivers. Major Powell came the hard way, through whitewater rapids and rock-ribbed gorges a thousand feet deep and more. Though many modern-day explorers still prefer to rough it on the rapids, today there's still an added attraction. From the Bridget Height to Glen Canyon Dam, the expansive waters of Lake Powell afford a new brand of adventure afloat.
Fifteen hundred miles of red rock shoreline, there's plenty of room to roam, to sunbathe and swim, or to laze like a bass along any one of countless coves and beaches. Whether by houseboat or sailboat, it's an unforgettable experience. of Lake Powell, beyond the turbulent canyons of the Colorado, a different kind of vista unfolds. The result of eons of wind and weather, the red rock desert of southeast Utah is a geological paradise, a billion years in the making. When C.E. Dutton of the Powell Survey first laid eyes on it a century ago, his thoughts were those of a poet. It is a sublime panorama, he wrote. A maze of cliffs and terraces, of crumbling buttes, red and white domes, rock platforms gashed with profound canyons, all glowing with bright color and flooded with blazing sunlight. Once the homeland of long vanished cliff dwellers, the high desert of the Colorado Plateau remains a place of unparalleled natural beauty, preserved today in the five national parks of Canyonlands, Arches, Capitol Reef, Bryce, and Zion. In the summer of 1847, the first Mormon settlers came to pioneer their own vision of paradise here. They were farming folk, determined to make the desert blossom. By inspiration and irrigation and plenty of perspiration, the dream soon became reality.
still there remained other dreams to be realized. From ancient riverbeds of the Uinta Basin would come evidence of yet another time and place when giants inhabited the earth. Today, Dinosaur National Monument at Vernal offers a unique glimpse into the Paleozoic past. The prehistoric graveyard is more than a scientific workshop, however. For the young, it is a spectacle to spark the imagination. For all, a reminder that ours is but a small moment in time. The place, Promontory Summit, Utah. The time, May 10th, 1869. Welcome. The last fight is the Atlantic. Here, 690 miles east of Sacramento, 1,086 miles west of Omaha, officials of the Central and Pacific Railroads met to celebrate the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. Today, visitors to Utah's Golden Spike Monument are invited to relive the excitement of that historic day. The driving of the Golden Spike was more than a wedding of east and west. Where railroad workers pitched their tents, new settlements would spring up. On the tracks of the Iron Horse would follow a new influx of trade, commerce and culture. have come a long way since that historic day at Promontory, but here in Provo Canyon, the age of the Iron Horse comes alive for a new generation, as the nostalgic whistle of the steam locomotive echoes through the hills. Golden Spike was a link with the future. Today's steam railroad is a link with the past, recalling a day when time itself seemed to move more slowly, when travel was more than a destination, and just the going was half of the fun.
mining boom of the 1870s brought another breed of citizen to Utah and a new brand of prosperity, as prospectors' claims grew overnight into mining camps and mining camps into cities, drawing lifeblood from taproots of silver, lead, copper, and gold. Today, the once faded storefronts of Park City have been restored, and yesteryear's boomtown is booming as never before. Where miners once worked with pick and shovel to earn a living, today the living is easy. Recreation is the main occupation in today's Park City, and winter or <laughs> summer, the slopes offered a mountain of good times. of Snowbird and Alta are bringing a new kind of excitement to the Wasatch as mile-high workshops for artists and artisans and year-round festivals of music.
changed since the men of the Rocky Mountain Fur Company celebrated their first springtime in Utah. Yet with the coming of a new year, in the dawning of another season, is reborn the promise of the frontier. It is a land ever changing, old yet young, with space and time enough to discover who we are. For all that is past is but the beginning of a new adventure.